think we've got a mission that matters here with Incredible Edible Tobinum. Uh, and I just want to just brain dump the journey, which has been a six year whirlwind experience for me that we're learning on all the time. And it's about an experiment. But it kicked off six years ago because I happened to be uh, in a room a bit bigger than this with a guy called Tim Lang speaking to us. And he was basically talking about the state of the planet. And, you know, without mincing words, <laughs> fundamentally, we're kind of sleepwalking into environmental disaster. Um, and whatever the exact temperature change or sea level or, you know, really clever techie stuff that we actually do, fundamentally, if we don't change the way that we actually live our lives, the legacy we're giving to our children ain't worth a hill of beans. And the real difficulty that I've got, and I've done loads of stuff in my life, and I've led authorities and I've advised governments and I've done, you know private sector stuff and God knows what else. And I am bored to death with people producing report after report, strategy after strategy, talk after talk, about the need to kind of do something. So, six years ago, I got on a train in London. Two and a half hours later, I was back in Manchester, and then half an hour after that in Todmorden, just to cite where I live. And that is where I live. And I'd made the whole thing up. Because basically, I just think the time now is for actions, not words. Is it possible that we might imagine that we can find a language that unites us, not separates us? A language that allows us to collectively start to live our lives differently. Start to see the spaces around us differently. Start to interact with each other differently. Start to feel better about ourselves. Is it possible that we can find that language that allows each and every one of us to be a leader, part of a solution, not a problem? In your, in your terminology, an innovator. Is it possible that each and every one of us, instead of when it gets a little bit too difficult, switching over the TV, might say, I know the bit of the jigsaw that I can put in this picture, and this is what I'm going to do. Is it possible that we could do that? And then if we could find that language, could we spread it? And the answer in the six years that I've been doing this is absolutely it is possible to do that. And the simple language is food. Now, you could go, you know, you could go through any door. I'm a great believer in just going through a door, see where it leads you, and then off you go. And I could have tried to find a collective sense of engagement and excitement around <laughs> peak oil. But, you know, it just doesn't quite do the same thing. And sustainability and climate change and all the really difficult issues are things that go right over a hell of a lot of people's heads. And what I wanted to create was a sense of a movement, to be part of something bigger than an individual, that meant that collectively, each and every one of us, irrespective of age, income, culture, or ability, could be a part of that solution. I didn't want a movement for Guardian readers. I wanted a movement for those people who didn't know where to start to create a better future. But maybe by the time they'd engaged through actions and engagement with other people that, that they live with, they might be able to find their piece of that kind of future. So here's the proposition. It was really crazy. It was like, you know, jumping off a wall and just taking a view that you were going to be caught. And I think we have been caught. And I think this is showing us that each and every one of us is part of that solution. Here's the town. It's Tobin. And you can see it's not the prettiest place in the entire world. It's got marginal land all around it. It's got failing schools. It's got obesity. It's got violence. It's got whatever else you've got in a market town in the north of England that has been ignored for some time. And if we actually bring things back to the human scale and start this conversation around food, all sorts of weird and wonderful things start to happen. And what we start to see is the spaces of our lives start to become occupied with edibles all over the place. We call them propaganda gardens. And basically, without asking anybody's permission to do it, we create propaganda gardens all over the town. And we don't do it because we believe that by creating those gardens next to the police station or on the main road or wherever it might be, we can feed the nation. But, we could, but because we can start to divert people's attention from the negative into the positive and start people to engage in conversations with complete strangers, out of which outcomes you would never imagine can happen. If you see community as the space that, you know, from the minute you walk out your front door, what's in your front garden, your back garden, along the street, when you go to the doctors, when you go to the school, if food was at the heart of that, an edible landscape at the heart of that, what might that do to the way that we think about some of our national policies, for example, like flying beans from some of the poorest people on the planet and feeding ourselves with them? That's a little bit weird, isn't it? Or what might that mean in terms of us thinking about how we start to spend public money or just... What might that mean in terms of what we can do 
in our own spaces to feed our children well. And then if you marry those edible landscapes and the action that's going on around that with learning, what are our kids taught in the schools? Are they actually taught things that, you know, by 2050 are going to be truly meaningful? Or have we missed half the talent because we've been focusing it on the tick boxes? What do we put local food at the heart of what our kids are being taught in the schools? Every single bit of the curriculum. Not something you do if you're really thick after school, but actually in science, in geography, in history. In, what if we did that? And then we married that with the informal learning that we can all do with each other between ourselves, you know, about baking and pickling and bottling or whatever else it might be. Might we not find, without a the need for a national policy, a way of regenerating some of our towns, such as Tobedon, simply by a self-belief that what we've got in our pocket can actually influence that equation? And collectively, we spun all those things. Could we not imagine that we re-established resilience without any multi-million pound campaign, top-down, allowing us to do it? Now, if you're going to do propaganda gardens in the middle of towns, wherever it might be, you've got to do them right in the heart of where people actually are. And there's no point in doing them in some side street, which nobody goes to. So you've got to take very public places. And on the whole, if you can get away with it, don't bother asking people's permission to do it, just do it. Because the easiest thing in the world is to get totally depressed because you're asking somebody to do something and they're nine times out of ten are going to tell you no. So if that's likely to be the solution, don't bother asking them. So, what we did, we've got a verge on the side of a street. It's just a normal main road. It's the one to Burnley, actually. And it ended, it looked like that thing at the top right-hand corner, which basically was a dog toilet. And because it was a dog toilet, nobody loved it, and they threw cans down there and fag packets and whatever else it might be. So, kind of in the middle of the night with balaclavas on, but not quite as bad as that, we went there and we cleaned it all up and we turned it into a fabulous herb bed with flowers and fruit and all the rest of it. And each and every one of our propaganda gardens is about helping yourself food to share. It's trying to break down this mentality of that's mine, get your hands off it. Now the interesting thing about all our propaganda gardens is it goes beyond the conversation because it actually starts to change people's behaviour, not just behaviour of the people that stand there and pick from the propaganda gardens, but the behaviour of the people that have some sort of sense of ownership of them. Because in this particular case, this dog toilet suddenly, 18 months after we'd actually turned it into a fantastic herb bed, and there was nothing clever about this, you don't need E equals MZ squared to make this work, suddenly the local authorities start mowing it and put a bench there so people can enjoy it. They never did that before, and if you'd asked them in the first place, they'd have said no. But they found a reason to say yes, and that shifted the way they started to think about the spaces in the town. And then there's the health centre. Now, occasionally, Health centre, police, those types of people, it pays to ask. So we did ask the doctor <laughs> and we said, would you mind if we actually, the brand new health centre, right? Multi-million pound health centre, what do they surround the health centre with? Inedible prickly plants. What is the point of that? We asked them, could we take up the, the inedible plants and plant edibles? And they said, yes, of course you can, provided you do it and we don't have to pay. And I said, that's absolutely fine. So that's what we did. We did some fundraising and we planted Apples, pears, raspberries, strawberries, and at the back, where there was a car park, we created an apothecary garden with mint and chamomile and whatever else it might be. And the really interesting thing about this is now we have families, and quite often some of the poorest families in the community, who can now go to a health centre, who can taste the raspberries, who can see things that aren't in a supermarket in a plastic bag, who can start to reconnect with their environment, and so it goes. You can't do this in one month, two months, three months, one year, two years. No, it takes time because we are decades away from personal responsibility and self-belief. But we are getting there, and all we're doing is using food. And now we have got people who then, you know, they come collectively, and they pick the strawberries, and they make the jam, and they share it with their neighbours, and so on. It's not rocket science, but isn't it interesting how give people a chance to actually be really quite creative in the community in which they live, and they'll grab it. And then, of course, because we've got a sense of humour and because the police station happens to be on a main road as well, we asked the police, of course we did, well, could we actually put a raised bed in front of uh, their police station? And they said, yes, you can. So we built it and we put sweet corn and anything else. And the really interesting thing about doing that is the police statistics themselves say community relations in the town, because of what we are doing, have never been better. Because who's not going to smile when they see a policeman watering his sweet corn? But also, <laughs> environmental damage in the town has, you know, it's down 80% year on year. Take little kids, let them get the soil under their fingers, let them get used to the fact that they have the potential to look after themselves in this future. 
teach them the importance of, you know, pollinators, that we're not the only species on this planet that makes any difference whatsoever. Give them some weird and wonderful things that they can plant in, like these, bo these boats that were about to be ditched by a local authority because they've got a hose in. Well, that's great, because they're great for planting beans in. Or give them tyres or whatever else it might be. And at the high school, because of what we were doing in that community, they themselves changed that, what they wanted to teach the children and they started to teach them a bee taking agriculture. So they might imagine that they could be the growers of the future. And given that Jonathan Porritt's new book, The World We Made, says quite clearly, the evidence is becoming quite strong that by 2050, 40% of food will be taken from urban areas. Where is the investment in the people that can make that happen? Where is the investment in that future, which is more about local economies and about, the, you know, about having a sense of place and a responsibility for it? And then we've got some places where we plant. This is a disused tennis court where we did some raised beds. It was adopted by the local uh, estate. And now this lady who was not speaking to anybody, but who is obviously brilliant at growing beans, has suddenly got everybody flocking to her front door and having a conversation with her. And because one of our schools doesn't have any land to grow on whatsoever, but happens to be placed quite, quite handily next to a graveyard, where, of course, as I always say, the soil is extremely good, the kids <laughs> go in here and they started to grow. We did ask permission for this one and it was all right. And the interesting thing about this is not only those kids now going in there and growing school food for their school dinner, but they are not afraid of the dead in that space anymore because it represents them, the living. And all we've done as volunteers is plant vegetables. And on top of that, we've created a new form of tourism, which is called vegetable tourism. And the truth of the matter is, people from all over the world come and visit us and poke around in quite often very empty beds. We're very big in China and Korea. We know the Russians love us, and mainland Europe is embarrassing in terms of the number of photographers they actually send to take pictures. And it, but it's not the vegetables. It's nothing to do with growing vegetables. It's about growing people and self-belief. This is a movement for everybody. You know, they're not all my age. Some of them, thank God, are younger and start, do understand technology. But basically, we have a really simple membership. If you eat, you're in. So anybody can be part <laughs> of the incredible edible movement. And I guess, at the end of the day, you know, one of the most difficult things for us to put up with is to try and stand our ground when sophisticated people say the challenge is too great for you. What you're trying to take on with this whole behaviour shift movement is something that we, the powers that be, are the ones that must lead on. Well, no, you don't need the powers that be. We are way ahead of politicians on this thinking because this is our world and it's our future. And we believe in the power of small actions, and we've seen that it works. And that is incredible edible. Thank you.